Well, here we go. Just a little treat for you again. Maybe you've already seen this, but uh, this is outlining the Bible here. In Genesis, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he is the rebuilder of the broken down walls of human life. In Esther, he is our Mordecai. In Job, he is our ever living redeemer. In Psalms, he is our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In Song of Solomon, he is our loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the Prince of Peace. Jeremiah, he is our righteous branch. In Lamentations, he is our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in life's fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is the faithful husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he is the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, he is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is mighty to save. In Jonah, he is our great foreign missionary. In Micah, he is the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is the avenger of God's way. In Habakkuk, he is God's evangelist crying, Revive thy works in the midst of the years. In Zephaniah, he is our savior. In Haggai, he is the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is the fountain opened up at the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he is the king of the Jews. In Mark, he is the servant. In Luke, he is the son of man, feeling what you feel. In John, he is the son of God. In Acts, he is the savior of the world. In Romans, he is the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he is the rock of all the earth. In 2 Corinthians, he is the triumphant one, giving victory. In Galatians, he is your liberty. He set you free. In Ephesians, he is the head of the church. In Philippians, he is your joy. In Colossians, he is your completeness. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he is your hope. In 1st Timothy, he is your faith. In 2nd Timothy, he is your stability. In Philemon, he is your benefactor. In Titus, he is truth. In Hebrews, he is your perfection. In James, he is the power behind your faith. In 1st Peter, he is your example. In 2nd Peter, he is your purity. In 1st John, he is your life. In 2nd John, he is your pattern. In 3rd John, he is your motivation. In Jude, he is the foundation of your faith. In Revelation, he is your coming king. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation, the creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and the manager of all time. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. Unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and he's pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He is risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. Schools can't explain him and the leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. Pharisees couldn't confuse him. The people couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The New Age can't replace him. And Oprah can't explain him away. He is life. Love, longevity, and more. He is goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. He is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging, and his mind is on me. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. He is my guide. He is my peace. He is my joy. He is my comfort. He is my Lord. He rules my life. Hey man, that's good, man. Well, you can see that. And you just had, so you just got your outline of the Bible right there, every book of the Bible. And so that's what we're doing every week, and today is Daniel. So we worked our way from Malachi, we're working our way back to Genesis. All right, you had the easy books, right? You had the little pop-ups, it's like that. Twelve chapters in Daniel, start working on Ezekiel. Start working on Ezekiel there. And uh, it's a little bit more than twelve chapters, so just work on that there. But here's your outline. Uh, for those of you listening online, you're going to have to go watch the video, but here's the outline, and then you can go to our book of Daniel that is more in-depth, uh, chapter by chapter, and get this outline as well. Some of the notes are on there in PDF form. But understand this, when it comes to, the, to God's Word, when it comes to Daniel, what he's trying to do here, this is a very well-attested-to book of the Old Testament. 
And it was written by, by Daniel. We're going to see that there was a, a guest lecturer in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar there. But we know that from all the works of antiquities, we know that the book of Daniel existed. And it existed before Alexander the Great even showed up. And Alexander the Great, when he had conquered people, uh, he got their liaisons there. He got uh, their language. He had to put it into the Greek language so he could study and read all about the people that he's conquered. And the Septuagint, uh, again, was already around. And we see that with Alexander uh, the Great. But again, we can see the various things here that are referred to through the book of Daniel as well. Um, a high priest was wearing his priestly garment when he came out to meet Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, in the night before, as, the, as his biographer, as his historian would say, that he had this vision that God said, you're not to destroy these people. Leave the Jerusalem alone. And they even asked him, his generals even asked him, Why did you, what are you doing here? He says, I saw this in a vision and I ain't going to do that. And so God's able to do those various things here. We see in 332 BC that Daniel was already written. The book of Daniel was already out there. It was already circulated. That's how Alexander the Great was able to take this Old Testament and was able to put it in what's called the Septuagint. And he was able to do that and find out about these things. And he was just amazed of just the, the history of just the prophecy. And still, I don't know, we'll find out when we get there if Alexander the Great ever accepted you know, the Lord as Nebuchadnezzar. But you could look at the various writing and people question the authenticity. And, yeah, you have to be, uh, maybe uh, understand some English and some grammar there. But used after 50 AD, when you're writing and we go through, and we see that in the New Testament, it is subject, verb, and object used in that way. So we know the authenticity of the authorship and about when it was written, because look, around 600 BC, it's subject, object, then verb. And again, for those of you guys who study English, I are getting pretty good at it myself. But understand, this is given a giving linguistic authorship to the book of Daniel. We know that Ezekiel refers to it plenty of times. Three times we know this, and we see this in contemporaries. We also see that Jesus, prior to the crucifixion, uh, makes reference to the book of Daniel. Unlike what I heard on the radio just before Easter, that uh, when it comes to same-sex marriage, and a local well, minister, for lack of a better term here, says, well, Jesus didn't know things back then. That we know now, if he was around today, he would evolve in his thinking and he would approve of same-sex marriage. And, there, and the, the, the nominal radio commentators are like, Jesus didn't know back then what he was saying. He didn't, is he the son of God? Is he God? And, and again, saying that he was very limited there. Going to Israel and touring one time, and Jesus, one of our tour guides, uh, obviously not saved, a Jewish, uh, uh, Israeli tour guide, telling us something. He goes, look, I know why Jesus made this statement. Because I can tell you what yeshiva he went to as a boy. And that's why this yeshiva and this certain type of study, they say that Isaiah, only one person wrote Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. But yet we know from other uh, accounts that there was a, quite a few people who wrote the book of Isaiah. And, and Jesus answers that question because he quotes from both of the quote unquote disputed sections of Isaiah. And we say, excuse me, uh, so you're saying it was because of the yeshiva he went to, because of the study of school he went to, that they said that there's only one Isaiah? And he goes, yeah, I can tell you that. I go, okay, I need you to be quiet. Uh, tell us about how much shipping is out of Haifa port and gross tonnage and how much corn is grown in here. But leave the Bible to those who know it. And he says, I take offense to that. And I don't take offense to you being wrong. I mean, how come you're the only one who can be offended in this conversation? And so we just go back and forth like that. So don't, 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 just leave the Word of God to those who actually are filled with the Holy Spirit and do those things. And give us the color commentary about all the other stuff we don't know. I would appreciate that. And you think, oh, that's pretty offensive. Still friends with that guy to this day. Actually, we've given him a Hebrew-English Bible. We've shown him other stuff. Give him our study materials. And he's actually a better tour guide. Still not saved. But now he knows our lingo. And he actually passes off. And people actually think that he's a Christian to this day because he knows so much facts and figures. Well, here's some of them right here. Daniel is named 75 times, 15 times in the first person. We know who's writing the book of Daniel. We see that what's coming through here. But let's look at the importance of this book. We know that it's the key to eschatology. It's a little scholarly word there for you for the study of the end times. And we know that, in, that it's the key to the book of Daniel. It really is it. If you study and major on the book of Daniel, but you need to do something with that information. I always 
frustrate my prophecy buff buddies. And they're always saying, hey, I've got this little nuance and this and this and that. And, da, 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 da. and they hate talking to me because they forget about the last time we had a conversation. And I found out this new nugget. I found out this new thing. And that's not like that. And I go, great. Who knows it besides you? Well, hey, bro, even biblical knowledge puffs up. Are you telling other people this? Are you telling others, like, hey, when they ask you a question, what's going on in this world? What's happening and stuff like that? Are you letting them know the things that you discovered? No, it's just personal things for me. And I'm like, man, get that information out there. So it's the key to eschatology, but it's not the key to eschatology for you to personally know just all by yourself. Get this information out there. So you study the book of Daniel, you can answer what's happening on the news even to this day. You look at the number two there, the rise and the fall of the major empires. We know that it's going to be God who does all these things. And again, these key verses right there, not only with the sovereignty of God and the affairs of men, but it is God, as you see here in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. And see that these are the things that, that He has all the wisdom and might are His. And if you have understanding, He'll give you more knowledge. Isn't it the other way around? If you get knowledge, then you'll have understanding. No? You see, this book, this Bible, this Word of God, it even tells us in Corinthians that it's spiritually discerned. The carnal man does not understand the things of God. They're foolishness to him. So if you have understanding of who wrote this book, and that understanding is in you, and your relationship with God makes you sure that you'll go to heaven when you die, God's going to give you more knowledge. Why? Because when you jump over to 1 Peter, and even 2 Peter, both in the first chapter, if you add to your knowledge... <laughs> What's going to happen? Faith, godliness, self-control. Do you understand what's happening here? You have that understanding, you have that knowledge. God's going to continue to give you more and more and more. Why? So you can give it out. And then fifth, the other theme is how to live godly in Babylon. And we'll discover that more as we get to the end here. But understand the structure of Daniel here. It's not laid out in chronological order. The first six chapters deals with the personal history of Daniel, which we'll get back to at the end of this message here. But chapter 7 through 12, the prophetic ministry of Daniel. And again, the key to eschatology. Here's a simple chronological order. Chapters 1 through 4, then chapters 7 and 8, then 5, 9, 6, and then 10 and 11. Read it in those order and that you'll make more sense. And we see that all the way through. You can take out chapters 9, 10, 11. Don't take out chapters 9, 10, 11 of Romans. But you can go right from chapter 8 to chapter 12. 9, 10, and 11, there's that parentheses. It's where the Apostle Paul hates using a period. And you just go on and on and on, and he just talks about in that whole grafting in. But he just puts that right in there. So again, this is the same thing as well. And so we go through here. We see the language in the Hebrew and the Aramaic, and, and again, the various chapters and how it's interspersed right there. Daniel was very well versed. He was a statesman. He was a statesman. He was a politician. He was a statesman in someone else's government. And so we're going to see that with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. We know from Leviticus, we know that Israel sins. We know that the historical background, we know that, again, Babylon conquered their southern kingdom known as Judah. The northern kingdom, a hundred years prior, was warned. And, and the southern kingdom didn't even take to that warning that even the Israel, the northern kingdom, was be taken away. We see that, again, the reason for the captivity... Again, their idolatry taken into captivity. Jeremiah even told them, look, surrender to the Babylonians. And what do they consider him? A traitor. You're, you're, you know, we're, you're Israel, you're, 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 you're a traitor. He says, no, no, you understand. If it, God had already told him. God had already told him. The Babylonians, if you don't fight them and you just surrender, they actually take pretty good care of you. When they would show up and say, we're here to conquer you, we surrender like, oh, man. No gouging out eyes and cutting out tongues. All right, fine. Sit down, have something to eat. And... But if you fight them, oh, it's, they, they're looking for it. Give them a reason. He says they'll take care of you. And so those are the things. They considered him a traitor there. And you see the various things here of, of, of this timeline that just goes through here through the Leviticus. We can see the ordinances to keep the Sabbath year. And so again, they didn't keep it for 490 years. So, he owes, so Israel owes them what? Seventy Sabbaths. There you go, man. You're going to do it. You're going to pay up. <laughs> Just don't mistake God's grace for you, giving you a time to repent or whatever, but you, you will pay every Sabbath. And we see in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. You might be more familiar with verse 11 of Jeremiah 29. But the plans that I have for you are to bless your socks off, your sandals or whatever. I, I, I want to bless you. I have great plans for you. I want to prosper you. I want to bless you. These are the things that I want to do. 
But again, we need to walk in obedience to those things. We see again taken of the captives of, of just these young boys. We're going to see Daniel and his three Hebrew uh, brothers in arms there, or his brothers uh, there. That just uh, again, we know that Isaiah a hundred years a hundred years earlier had prophesied what was going to happen, and again the southern kingdom didn't take that warning. We know that Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we'll see 91 times uh, total, 60 times outside the book of Daniel. We're going to see Nebuchadnezzar mentioned 60. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a prominent name. And it's going to be referred to over and over again that we can learn a lesson from that. If that name just keeps coming over and over and over again. And then we're going to see that when he came to Jerusalem, Daniel may have been in Babylon, but again, understand where his heart was. It's a key thing for Daniel. Understand that. Being taken captive and you're going to be going to Babylon. Understand the childhood. All the plans that they had growing up. Think about the plans that you had and then something gets interrupted. You see your family and friends just massacred. You see parents or aunties and uncles killed right before you. You see the king's sons are, are put to death and their eyes are gouged out and the king's being brought back to uh, Babylon. You do all these things, it just comes over and over again. And then the Solomon's temple, destroyed, wiped out. And like, how could this be? I thought, I thought huh, how could a good and loving God let bad things happen to good people? Do you think that was only said here now in this day and age? Bad things happen to bad people. And I looked in the mirror this morning, I'm looking around here, every one of us are bad. Jesus tells us there's not one that is good. That's a freeing thing, by the way. And understand and be freed from that. So we see Solomon's temple is burned here. And the Babylonians, again, they took others and they, and they took them away. These are pictures right here, some of the stones that are from the destruction in 70 AD by the Romans. Those stones are still there that were pushed over from the temple mount. The temple's not there. Just as Jesus said that would happen. Just as there was also prophecy in Jeremiah that you're going to come back, it'll be rebuilt, and it'll be destroyed again because there'll be other problems you guys are having. That's the Dome of the Rock. That's not the mosque. The al Aska Mosque is a little bit to the south of that, but it's there in the Temple Mount area. And then we know with Jehoiakim. So there's all these things. Look, there's nothing in God's Word by happenstance. There's nothing in God's word that are like filler words. They gives us dates, they gives us times. When you look at 2 Chronicles, or actually first and 2 Chronicles, the Bible, the word of God, especially there, they give us 29 kings, 29 dynasties, 29 years, or 29 different time spans, and all the kings' names are in order of succession and the proper spellings of their name. All the other recovered history and data from the Rosetta Stone and the Chaldean verses and all these, all these other stones. and They cracked the code of the language there and they're like, the Bible is true. Archaeologists still use the Bible to this day, not for salvation, but to, again, finding where, well, where, where geographically where it is. Well, it says it was right here. And they start digging there. There it is. Those are the things that go on there. And so we see there... That again, giving the various dreams to Nebuchadnezzar and, and the various things. Understand this, they weren't stolen, by the way. God gave them into their hands. See, we're going to see the sovereignty of God and the affairs of men. God gave them a hand. And that's the same thing as we see in the New Testament in Revelation. You don't lose your first love, you leave it. Angel speaks to him and says, hey, you have left your first love. You didn't lose it. They did not conquer them. God handed them over because God was using the Babylonians and even some of the, even Jeremiah is like, why the Babylonians? I mean, I know we're bad, but why are you using them? I mean, they're really bad. And God even speaks to them. He says, don't worry, they're going to be punished. But we're going to see some things here that happen with Nebuchadnezzar as well. We'll see that, with, again, some of the articles that have been taken, and, and they're going to be used in a profane way. And, and these are some of the things that have been listed there, of the, the silver basins and the bronze pots and the shovels there. They were carried away into the land of Shinar or, or Babylon, giving you the facts and figures of as far as the, the wall being 30, 330 uh, feet high, uh, 80 feet wide, enough for, I, I don't know what you do with the measurements of this. They got the measurements of this, but I'll just give you the quote. They could raise six chariots across and not touch each other and go around all the walls of Babylon. I have no, I, that, is that six Yugo specs? Uh, the, the car, I, what is, but it's 80 feet wide, folks. All the way around. And, and again, as I'll show you some of the pictures some marine buddies took there, there was 225 square miles inside of it. About the size of St. Paul. If there was a wall, 15 miles, St. Paul is 16 square miles. And you take it all and put a wall all around St. Paul. 
330 feet high, and again, uh, you could uh, be on those walls and see in the Great Plains. And again, it was built up. We'll see here that, again, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, they were known in secular history as the most beautiful thing, and just what Nebuchadnezzar had done and the building up of Babylon. Much gold and silver. In fact, the Hanging Gardens and the palaces just covered in gold. Covered in gold. And you could see it shining from many distances away. This is looking to the east. This is a picture taken from the west from some marine buddies who uh, flew in. I got some pictures of them flying in over in a helicopter. But this is what you're looking at. And this is some of the recovered areas. But this is some of the stuff that Saddam Hussein had rebuilt. He wanted to reposition the UN there in Babylon, the cradle of civilization. This is about 60 miles north of Baghdad. Here's some of the very ancient streets that are still in existence to this day that Saddam Hussein, again, had, been rest- had restored. Uh, here's some of the various bricks that are being used and the various streets that Daniel had probably had walked through. Nebuchadnezzar right there. This is some of the wall system there that's been taken down. And here's some of the brick systems. I've showed some of you guys this before. You can see the bricks on the lower level. That's still the bricks that Nebuchadnezzar, stamped with his name, Nebuchadnezzar. This city built by Nebuchadnezzar. And Saddam was saying with his name on the modern day bricks above, saying his name that he was considered himself Nebuchadnezzar II. This is a picture looking to the west looking, I guess, to the west and south to where Baghdad would be, but again, up higher up. So again, this is just what's been excavated. They haven't even found all the walls, uh, again, that were 330 feet high, but this is inside that city there. So again, God had given Nebuchadnezzar a dream, and this lines up with history, by the way, folks. This lines up with everything that has already taken the place. In fact, Alexander the Great was blown away when he was able to read the prophecies and how, again, it even talks about him, and about his kingdom, about the Greeks coming. And so we see this when it comes to Nebuchadnezzar's dream about this, about this statue. And he says, I had a dream. And you guys, if you're really all that in a bag of chips, tell me what the dream was and then interpret the dream. And only Daniel could come to pass and say, this is what it is, O king. My God will give the answer. See, Daniel had already purposed in his heart that he was going to walk with the Lord and he was going to do those things. Understand the key to eschatology as well as when we get to the, the 70 weeks of Daniel. We'll see that in Daniel chapter 9. Maybe you've already read ahead. But this is a key to eschatology, the study of the end times. This is why that you can be able to tell people about certain things that are going on. And again, talk is as ascertained fact that it's always going to be because, again, the history has already prevailed. That statue and everything and about the Roman Empire and everything and about being revived in that rock that was made without any human intervention whatsoever, a rock cut without human hands and comes and it crushes the feet that are uh, of clay and of metal and again and mixed in that revived Roman Empire, the East and the West coming together. And we see that's happened in the European community even today. That's all right there in the book of Daniel. Again, seeing these stones that again from 70 AD, you can only imagine what happened when Nebuchadnezzar came in and just leveled Jerusalem there. But how do you do this? How do you explain in context a peacock to a blind person? How do you do that? How do you explain that in context when it comes to that? How do you explain all the vibrant colors and stuff and they just don't understand those things? If you learn to crack the code, folks, when it comes to eschatology, when it comes to the book of Daniel, you can find some things out. And there's pinpoint accuracy when it comes to this. If you're trying to tell the future and trying to you know, con people out of something, you don't put exact dates down. And so the prophecy is that we see here that it comes to the, the 70th week of Daniel. Let's look at it as a, when it comes to like a bomb. And there's a bomb, and it's powered by Dura Israel. I like that little battery picture right there. And, it, and, it's, and it's going to be, there's going to be 70 increments. There's going to be 70 weeks. There's going to be seven distinct periods, and these are the things that are going to happen on them. And then they're going to happen from a specific date. We know this not just in the Bible because it gives us the Hebrew calendar in that date, but we know from secular history, and we know from the conquests of Nebuchadnezzar, from that statue that Nebuchadnezzar had in that dream, from Cyrus to Artaxerxes, what was going to happen. And when it says, when it's time to rebuild Jerusalem, from that day forward, there's going to be so many weeks, and the Messiah will be cut off outside of Jerusalem there. And so here's the thing that comes down to. That date comes down to, and it's ascertained fact, folks. All right, it's it's ascertained facts that it is March 14th, 445 B.C., And then this was the prophecy. Again, there's going to be 70 increments of time. And there's going to be specific things there. And here they are. They're broken out to you. There's going to be seven weeks. And there's a certain thing that happens in Israel's history. Again, go to our more in-depth study online. And then there's going to be 62 weeks 
of a period that the things are going to be turned over. But at the 69th week, again, these groups, these seven weeks of periods here, it comes to 483 years. And then there's going to be a 70th week, that final week. And we know that to be the, the seven-year period known as the tribulation. And it's the whole seven years. And there's very specific things about that seven-year period. And just understand this with near fulfillment and far fulfillment. Jesus, when he came to that synagogue in Nazareth, and he spoke and he said, and he, and he read Isaiah 61 and 62. And he proclaims that in the hearing, this prophecy, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. But he didn't read the last part of verse 2. He said, look, the blind will receive their sight, the lame will walk, the dead will be raised, and be preaching the good news. And the day of salvation of our Lord, and the captives will be set free. And he doesn't finish the last part of that verse. And the day of vengeance of our God. He's talking about his first coming. So there's a near fulfillment right now, and then there's a far fulfillment. It's the same way. So don't think that these 70 weeks this has got to happen just right in order, one after the other. There's something holding it back. There's something, there is a parenthesis. There is a gap. There is something that's happening here, and we get that. But he tells us that 173,880 days to the day, Messiah will become riding in on a donkey, and he will be cut off at the end of that week. And he'll be cut out outside of Jerusalem. And he gives us the pinpoint accuracy. And there's no other date to come up with than those right here. We've seen this right here. So 173,880 days. We see with Jesus, and again, he started his, his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius. So that gives us a timeline right there as well. Again, you're writing a 500-word essay for school, right, for English. And maybe you did like I did, you know, once upon a time, a long, 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 long time ago, there was this really old, 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 old dude who lived far, far, far away. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, I just had to start counting the... There's no filler words. Everything in God's Word is for you and I to discover, and it gives us a clue, and it gives us a tip, and it gives us those things, and the Holy Spirit says, oh, I just got to fill up so many volumes, I got to make this convincing. It gives us various dates. That's why the archaeologists and the professors of, of ancient history can look at the Bible in First and Second Chronicles, and they're still, even to this day, in secular uh, universities here, they can look at this and they go, they got all the right, right order of all the kings mentioned, the 29 of them mentioned, their proper spelling, their timelines, where they overlapped, who they were, and then they put together all their other data from all the other sources, and they find out the Bible has it very concise, and it's right there. Again, from all the various other things, we know that in each of this, we see this. We see in that final Passover in 32 AD. We see the things again here, 173,880 days. Messiah will come riding in. Say, maybe you're just a prophecy buff. You're waiting for Messiah. Okay, you're alive around that. Okay, it's going to be around 32 AD. I'm around 32 AD. We didn't know it was 32 AD because we talk about anadonomy after the death of Christ, but we didn't know that. But it's just 32 now. And, and, and we're here, and these things happen, and it comes in on that day. Well, and it's never happened before, and it hasn't happened since. So let's go back to this time bomb. There's something right here that the hand is going to tick, and it's going to go, and it's going to tick to, the, to zero. But there's something that's in the way. I believe that is the church. Because it talks about that, that it will be cut off. And then there's going to be this parenthesis. There's going to be something that holds it back, just as Paul says in Second Thessalonians. That is what we know as the church age. And understand this, that Israel is not the church. That was never even an issue up until about 200 years ago. And, and others started saying, hey, look, the church is Israel. And, and that's what we're doing, all these promises. And, and then if you believe that, then yeah, I guess, I guess you would be going through the tribulation. But the problem is, it should be easier for us to believe in Christ and the Bible and the prophecy and everything now. Since May 14th, 1948, Israel has existed. And, but there's this church age, and Jew and Gentile alike are part of that church, that bride of Christ, and it's holding that timer back. The battery's been dislodged, and it will come back in, and it will start back up at a certain time. The battery's going to be put back in when? March 14th, 1948. And it's just kind of, there's like pressure on that, on that hand wanting to finish it off, but something's going to happen. That peg that's holding that timer is going to be removed. The church is going to be raptured out, and then the timeline starts. And there's going to be this covenant made with this Antichrist, this false Christ, and it's going to happen. 
And the temple's going to be rebuilt, and there's going to be this world peace. We're studying that through Revelation. And then again, go to deeper study in Daniel online, and you can listen to the studies and look at some of the notes and stuff. But again, even our study in Revelation, there's going to be this Antichrist. And in that middle of that three and a half years, that covenant that he made is going to be broken. There's going to be a literal seven-year period that will be fulfilled, but that is dealing with the nation of Israel. God is going to once again deal with the nation of Israel and whoever else is left on the face of the earth. This is why Daniel is the key to eschatology, and you can explain why is Israel in the news every day? Every day. Why do you even care, world? It's just this tiny speck, little of a nation. But we'll see some things that have happened here that uh, says for you and I. When you read the various commentators, and they talk about the abomination of desolation, that that's going to be the Antichrist. When he's done with the religious world system, that one world religion, he'll be done away with that. And he'll just be dealing with the political, that mystery Babylon. He won't need that. And everything's coming, everything's working towards a world government and a world religion. Let's just all be one. We are the world and all that. You know, it's only going to last for three and a half years. All that effort for three and a half years. Man, oh man. And so here's the thing that just comes down to, and we see the various prophecies, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Paul referred to the idolatry of the coming of that prince, that one, that antichrist. And that covenant will be broken, but what do we know from God's word? Israel will be protected. Tribulation saints, where are they going to go? They're going to flee to Petra. They're going to be in that land of of Edom. They're going to be taken care of there. They'll be protected in that time, everyone who makes it there. But God is going to be dealing with the nation of Israel again, so the church being taken out. And then that 70th week of Daniel, and that, again, read through the book of Daniel. And just like Al Gore has said, there will be global warming. Just not the way that he's thinking about it, okay? There will be some thermal nuclear action happening there. And that's going to do that. But let's look at the importance of this book again. We know that it's the key to eschatology. What are you doing with that information? To just study God's word, again, even spiritual knowledge can puff up. And just what are you doing with that information? Get it out. If this stuff excites you and you want to study prophecy and eschatology and you just want to major in Daniel, then go for it, man. You're going to get to every other book of the Bible as well. And you'll be able to correlate those things and you'll be able to share with others and you'll be able to look at the newspaper every day. You can assign your family and friends up to calvaryprophecy.com. I like what Terry Malone's done. He's got a tribulation survival guidebook. If you're left behind, read this. Number one, drop to your knees. (laughs) You've been left behind. Give your life to Christ. Now, while you're here in this tribulation, this is what you're going to do. Let that scare people. Let them get kind of ooh and ah and stuff. And we go to this whole thing that it is the the rise and fall of major empires. Again, we understand that it's God dealing with the sovereignty of man, but everything is pertaining to Israel. What happens? what, What do you care what happens to the European community? Why do they care what happens in Israel? By the way, 70% of the fruit and the flowers that come into Europe come in through Israel. They produce Europe's major, because they grow all year round. They're a major exporter. Tourism is not the number one industry of Israel. One, technology is. Two, agricultural. And three, the military industrial complex. And then fourth is quite possibly uh, tourism. And so here's the thing. Why the rise and fall of nations and why do they care what happens to Israel, but yet it seems to be around them? Also, number three is that the sovereignty of God in the affairs of men. He's concerned about every aspect of our lives, folks. Every aspect of our lives. What is the Holy Spirit leading in our lives here today and what are we doing? He's worried and he's concerned. Not worried, but he's concerned about every aspect if we allow him to have every aspect of our lives. And understand the various key verses as we put this into context here. That it says here in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. Who do they belong to? Wisdom and might? To the Lord. And, his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the, to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. If you have understanding, he's going to give you knowledge because why? You're going to be able to do something with it. If you have understanding, then you get knowledge and you're able to do something with it. But if you don't have understanding and all you have is a, your spiritual streaker, you've got your helmet of salvation on, and that's it, and you're going to, fine. But if you have understanding and you want understanding, then you look through all the way through God's Word. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. He doesn't want us to be unaware. You look through and says, look, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, this church. Let me tell you what this is. 
understand that I, uh, that I know and understand He doesn't want to leave us a lacking anything. And He gives us those things. And then we look at, finally, that how to live godly in Babylon. How to live godly in Babylon when we go through and we look at the various books of the Bible and we see this when it comes to Daniel. We see that Daniel, again, being this statesman in another man's government, and he was raised up. And look, taken as a young man, and he, and he was put into pagan university. He spent three years at PU, learning everything PU had to offer. And that's what he got. Where'd you get your degree from? PU. What? PU. Pagan university. But look what he had already purposed in chapter 1. He already knew. Understand this, folks. 500 miles away in Jerusalem, he's conquered. He's taken to Babylon. He's got a 500-mile walk. He knows what the Babylonians are all about. He didn't come to Babylon and then he was challenged and all of a sudden he comes up and tries to make a decision. Just like God in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. God has plans. I can have plans too. I'm going to need to submit them to the Lord. But understand what he's taken. He already has the commandments. He's already purposed and determined in his heart, in his mind, in his whole being. I am not. I am going to be living in Babylon. Listen, I'm going to be living in Babylon, but Babylon will not be living in me. I may be in Babylon, but man, all I'm thinking about is Jerusalem. And we just got to wait out 70 years. And then they put him in PU, Pagan University, and he's learning all the stuff PU has to offer. And so here's the thing that he comes in. And understand, they, they try to change. They try to strip away their identity there. We see that and, and try to do the norms of the, of the world and the compromises. And he says, look, we don't want to. Look, I, I'm, I'm going to eat kosher. I'm not going to eat the king's meat and his wine. And, and again, he don't, just don't go there and just plant your flag. I'm this way and that's no way. But... Offer those that you are, again, God is punishing. You're under their authority now. Say, well, let me give you an alternative. Why don't we just do a test for 10 days? That's a bold statement there. You can do that on the job right now. Job says, well, you lie. Tell them we're not here. Kind of fudge the paperwork a little bit there. Move some stuff around. Do some numbers. Crunch some numbers and do all these things. And figures never lie, but liars always what? Figure, all right? Do these things. That's just the way that we do things here. And you might even say, oh, well, I'm a Christian too, and I prayed about it. Whatever the comment, he's already predetermined. I'm not going to do that. He's a 500-mile walk to say, I'm not going to do that. So maybe they're just going to kill him right away, and the whole thing's done and over. But if, but if God's sovereignty, and by chance that I'm going to live, then I'm going to live by these things. I'm going to do this, and his other three buddies, the same thing. We're going to do this together. We're going to have a band of brothers before band of brothers was ever made. We're going to have a band of brothers. We're going to stick together and we're going to do this and we're going to encourage one another and we're going to do these things. And they did everything they could to brainwash them. Let's go through some names here. And all their names also reflected all the various things. The Babylonians begin to brainwash. We've got to strip away their identity. And that's what the Babylonians did. They would conquer a people, bring them to Babylon, and then what Babylon would do is take a people from another conquered nation, put them in the other conquered nation. They would, they would mix all the races and people up so you couldn't know how to get away. And what do you do? They put you in another foreign land, but after you've been educated, re-educated there. So they stripped them down. They gave them new names. And they tried to replace their personal identities. And the names that reflected their faith in Jehovah. uh, 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 Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah is Jehovah is gracious. Mishael is who is is, uh, what God is. Azariah, his name means Jehovah has helped me. But their godly names were replaced with pagan names. Daniel's name, his becomes Belshazzar, or Bel protects, another pagan god. Bel protects, that's one of their chief idols. Their Shadrach's name he gives, means command of Marduk, a Babylonian a god. Meshach is who is what Murdoch is, instead of who is what God is. Who is what Murdoch is to replace Mishael, who is what God is. And Abednego means servant of Nebo. So here's your new names. Here's the things that are coming. You know, they're not the first to invent this. God had already done that. Your, your name is now going to be called Israel, governed by God. We even see with Jesus in the New Testament, hey, you're going to be Peter. Rock! No, little, little stone. Rock! 
little, pet your little, little, run. Oh, got it. All right, you're going to be a little one there, all right? But the names are going to be changed. These things are going to go on there. And so again, they go through and they do everything, man. The clothing, the style, the culture, the means and everything to strip away their old identities to give them this. And but what did Daniel had decided? Him and all the others. What did they decide? We're not going to cave in. We're not going to do this. We're going to have this purpose and we're going to have this proposal. We're going to do these things. Look, after 10 days, just see if we're better. I've already purposed. Daniel 1.8, I have already purposed. I've already decided this. Listen, if you're taking notes, write down 11 seconds. 11 seconds to determine your fate when an incident happens. 11 seconds. They've done studies of just people in tragedies from airplane crashes of people who survived, shipwrecks, all of these other things, train crashes, automobile. 11 seconds. The first four or five seconds are taken up with like, what is happening here? You're trying to normalize what's going on here. Why is my head going through the windshield? Hello, everybody. Just what's happening? And you're trying to figure that out. You got a couple more seconds to figure like, I'm going through the windshield soon. And then you've got to act. Ah, and whatever. My arms are breaking. And whatever that situation is, you really only have a couple of seconds. But those who get on a plane and know where the emergency exits are, those who know the, the certain surroundings that they're in, when something they're prepared, and not paranoid, but just prepared, they've already purposed, they already know. Look. I want to tell you something, if you haven't known this already, those who seek to live a godly life will be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. Jesus says they're going to hate you because they first hated me. This is news to you. You need to get ready for this. When someone says, hey, you Jesus freak, and you go, get ready and say, yeah, that's right. Whose freak are you? Just have that comeback. Because they think they're all smart. Like that's the first time that was ever said. There's nothing new under the sun. I, I, you ask any one of my children, they'll tell you that just every time we argue with dad or something like that, he just had a comeback. Why? They don't realize this, and maybe some of you kids don't realize it. We were kids once. We know what you're going to say. How do you know? We said it. One line and one line only have I never been able to use, and I even tried to push one of my kids even to get it because I wanted to say it. But every time they would have something, I'd just fire right back because I, I just want to keep them on point. And when they say, and you can do it. This line can be used. Someone use it. But I was ready for any one of my kids to say, you're the worst parents in the world. And I'm going to go, nah, mine were. Now back to mowing the yard. Now this is what's going to go on, you know. You're ruining my life. I know. That's why I had kids. And some think you can take a hint. You know, and just, now back on point, you just they're going to say these things. They're going to do these things. Someone's going to call you a Jesus freak. Say, That's right, whose freak are you? And, and, or they're going to say whatever. They're going to hate you because they first hated Jesus. Be prepared for it. You see, I look at history and I look at even the recent shootings of, at churches and at theaters and stuff. And I'm more interested in the interviews of what people did and didn't do. I'm real key to the, to the interviewing and, and, and what survivors, keyword survivors all say, and what they did and did not do, and, and just being prepared. There are certain things that I just know that if someone comes into a room with a gun, <clears throat> or say you're at a bank, and someone comes in, or they're robbing a place, I just want to let you know something, because I feel as your pastor, you need to be prepared for this. If the, some place is being robbed and they're not wearing masks, they're not concerned about witnesses. If they come in and they're wearing masks, they want to live and get out of there. But if someone comes in and they're not wearing masks, why not go ahead and fight them, fight out, come up with a plan? I'm just letting you know. They're not concerned. That's, the SWAT knows that. Police know that. They're in there, they have no masks. Oh, this is going to be bad. We've got to get in there quicker. They know that. Just be prepared for that. Do you know where the exits are when you're in a restaurant? Do you know how, where the egresses are? Do you know where the best places are? How are you going to prepare and defend your family and your lives and all like that? That's just in this life. What about in the life to come? It's appointed on a man once to die and then face judgment. What about eternity? If I can be all that hip and understand and have certain knife skills or gun skills and stuff like that, and I can do this in this life, what about the life to come? Daniel had already purposed and had a plan and offered them. 
Maybe you can do this at work and say, hey boss, I really don't, you know, my convictions, my, I can't lie, I'm not going to be doing that. I, not that I can't, I just decide not to lie. And how about if we do it this way? Let me, let me try my sales. Let me be honest. Let me just totally tell them everything and, and see how much sales I get. Put the challenge out there. But here's the thing. You've got to put your life on the line and say, I'm going to live my life for the Lord. And I'm saying the way God has it, this is the way it's going to be, and I'm going to do this. You can do it for whatever situation. And you do that for the Lord. This is Daniel. They stripped away his identity. They try to culturalize him. He's there wasting away at PU, but he learns all their wisdom. He learns all their stuff. He's brought into Nebuchadnezzar. And because of his stand, we know that Nebuchadnezzar and his pride, as you go through the Word of God here, as you go through Daniel, he loses his mind for seven years, eating grass like an animal. His hair not being taken care of, looks like eagle's feathers. And yet we know from secular history, and we even know from the implied from here of the Scripture, it was Daniel who stood by Nebuchadnezzar's side and kept him because he said, that's the man that God has for and he's going to come back. And it was, it was Daniel who stood by his side and was able to do and to bring Nebuchadnezzar back into power after throwing Meshach, Radshach, and Abednego into the furnace. After putting Daniel in the lion's den. After, 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 because they had already purposed and they already know what God had for them. And all their identity could be stripped away. Do you guys understand something? Daniel lived in Babylon, but Babylon did not live in Daniel. Doesn't matter what the outward appearance and all that kind of stuff that goes on there. They know all the statesman stuff. They know all the stuff when it comes to this. The world around them hates them. Nebuchadnezzar has this statue built and... People are going to bow down, and then with Meshach, Radshach, and Abednego, what do they do? They don't bow down. It's kind of going to stick out there. You guys aren't doing it. We're not going to do it. They could have hid. They could have gone away. They could have made themselves scarce. Daniel didn't have to open up when they made this edict that you're not going to pray. He didn't have to open up his windows every day. Like, I'm just sticking true to form. And this is what I'm going to do. Do people know at the restaurant that you're praying over your meal? And that you're different than maybe the Catholics or the Lutherans or somebody else who's just going specs, watch, wallet, passport, whatever. I just, do they know what you're doing when you're praying? Well, they do when I do. People ask me to pray. I feel I pray for everyone's meals. The whole restaurant's got to hear. But I I say, well, and I I did this. I thought, why do you, you embarrassed me. And I just simply say, well, how many people, you sitting and eating your meal in quietness, have come to the Lord? Who have you gotten to talk to the Lord about? I just kind of put it out there. And I try to flatter the waitress and I try to do all the things and it's a fun time. It's the dinner show. And just, we did it this, this, this weekend. And, and Nancy, if you're listening, I hope you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But here's the thing, it's like, well, what's going on? And we come to this restaurant, we're doing, what are you doing? And I just, <clears throat> and they said everything was homemade. And I asked the waitress, well, you said the clam chowder's homemade. Yeah, does it come out of a big can or a little can that says homemade? They go, it's homemade here. So you get indignant. I said, okay. All right, all right. I mean, and she just brings me in this. Night, and I says, How, oh, that's made. That's wonderful. This is amazing. I said, should I just get a cup or should I get a bowl? She goes, oh, you want a, you want a bowl? I said, this is amazing. I just got up and 100 or so people in the restaurant, I felt they needed to know that Nancy did me a solid. I would have gone with a cup, and I stood up there, and I just said, hey, everyone, I just want to let you guys know, I'm eating a bowl of this wonderful clam chowder that tastes like tiny little angels are kissing the inside of my mouth. And I just want to let you know that Nancy talked me into getting a bowl of this instead of a cup. And back in the day, before I knew Jesus Christ as my Savior and your Lord, I could have used her as one of my drug dealers. Because, man, I took that bowl of clam chowder over the cup, and she really sold me on that one. And everyone in Owatana at this restaurant, Owatana, in this restaurant, and I just kind of said, I just, let's just give it up for Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. And she's just, everyone's just applauding. They're all just kind of smiling and looking at it. She comes back and she just goes, you know, 33 years working in this restaurant, I've never been applauded. I said, 33 years? She goes, yeah. I go, just a summer job gone bad? What happened? And she goes, oh, no, I, I like working here. That's amazing. I said, me and this other guy right here, Ed said, we're going to have a contest. And I split our bill. She's like, oh, I split the check. I said, yeah, we're going to have a contest. We're going to see who tips the most. And you have to judge and you tell us. I'm like, what? Yeah, we're going to do that. And she's like, all right. And 
And then I just get up and she brings more. And then, and then everyone, there seems to be a run on clam chowder that day. She just run in clam chowder. And, and Ed, who doesn't even like clam chowder, says, I'll take a bowl of that clam chowder sitting right there. Oh, he benefited from the fruit of my labor. She brought him a bowl of clam chowder. And he was just like a mound over his like He couldn't even stick a spoon. He thought it was almost like, I wanted to say, hey, his bowl's bigger than I... That, they just poured it on there. I said, man, you benefited from this. He's like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. We're just talking and talking. She says, well, who are you guys? Oh, we're going to a men's retreat. Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord. These are the things. We start sharing Christ with. This is amazing. And then I asked for a piece of pie. And I saw their little wedges of pie. I'm not talking about how God could add, but that pie slice came out a little bit larger there. And the soups and the food and everything, I was just kind of, oh, we're just having a good time. And I stand up again. I said, I feel like I'm being hugged from the inside out. God is good. God is good. Amen. All right. And they're just like, want to know more? They just they said, want Okay. And then we go to our bills and we're tipping. And, and Ed beat me by 67 cents. We both over tipped by 10 bucks each. Uh, but he was 67. She's like, really? You got, I said, did, did he win? Yeah, by, by 67 cents. Really? Looking at the... And then I said, Nancy, I go, we've been here for about an hour and people are pointing at our table and they're laughing and they're snickering as they go by. She goes, well, could it be because you're loud? I said, oh, I thought it was because Alex is black. <laughs> and she just kind of looks at me and Alex just doesn't miss the cue. He goes, I'm black? <laughs> I'm black? No one ever told me. I'm black. He's looking around black. No one told me. And she's like, who are you people? <laughs> Hand her my business card, passed her. She does the same thing. No. No. I said, why don't you listen online? Why don't you do this? We're coming back and we're going to do this. And I'm telling her I'm going to bring back my first wife. And uh, I'm going to come back. And she's... <clears throat> We get to share with her. You know, you know, Nancy, before I had a relationship with God, my life best could be characterized by the word despair. I was always in despair. You see, what you're seeing right now with this joy has happened, I'm excited because I'm, my relationship with God makes me sure I'll go to heaven when I die. And some friends of mine shared with that with me. And you know what? When I came to understand that relationship, my life now can best be characterized by fun at other people's expense. Fun. In fact, it gets me past some of the rocky points in my life because my relationship... How about you? Does your relationship with God make you sure you go to heaven when you die? You might try it. You can be quiet. That's just at a restaurant. You can be quiet at work. You can let people go to hell. You can make them guess if they know. You have the key to eschatology, to the study of end times, why Israel is in the news. But you may live in Babylon, but Babylon doesn't have to live in you. You live in this world, but the world does not have to live in you. When you become a friend of the world, Timothy tells us, you become an enemy of who? God, you don't want to be an enemy of God. When you replace the fellowship and, and the friendship of the world in that place, you don't want to be an enemy of God. We see this in the first six chapters of Daniel. When it comes to these things here in Daniel's life, no compromise, gives an, gives an alternate way, says, let me do it this way, let me do it Godly's way. You know, someone comes second service and just sharing with me, I'm not going to mention any names, Lori or Laura, but you're sitting right there. And she's just sharing at work and how they're going to this training thing. And the same thing I'm talking about today. And just whether this cures her for ever talking to me before service again, I don't know. But I just share with you what she did with me. It's like, you know, we were just, how do you treat people at work? And people were quoting scripture, but as long as you didn't quote the scripture verse, well, how about do unto others you have them do unto you? How about those who, you know, about treating others with respect and all, and just starting to like, that, and the instructor, that's good. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. It's in the Bible. You know, well, just, well I, it's right here. Well, well, it's in the Bible. We shouldn't do that. You know, the world says, don't do unto others what you wouldn't have them to do. That's in the negative. It doesn't matter what someone does to you. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It doesn't regard if they do it or not. That's God's word. Daniel had purposed in his heart, and before he was ever tested, and he would be tested, before it was ever brought into question, before it was ever, ha he knew the Babylonians. You know the questions that's going to come up that someone's going to ask you about same-sex marriage. You've got 11 seconds, folks. 
to figure out what you're going to do in your fate at work or what's going to happen, stuff like that. Just negate that right now. Purpose and plan in your heart what you're going to say and do right now. You're already ready for it. This whole thing, whether you're gun rights or our civil rights or all these things, per, what is your plan? Don't, when you're confronted, you are going to be confronted with this. What is your plan? What is your purpose? For those of you who want to be married, I'm just going to tell you something, man. There's a high probability that after marriage, you're probably going to have kids. And even a greater probability that the woman's going to carry the child. I'm just saying. And if you don't do something about it, God loves babies. All right? Talk that to Pastor Mike Booker down in Cleveland. That's 13 kids. Understand this. And he's already planning his purpose and how you're going to raise and to train and raise up your kids and what you're going to do. They're going to happen. What sayings, what things are you going to... They're going to come. They're going to happen. They're going to have those questions. They're going to say those things. They're going to see people dressing up as goblins and ghouls at every October. What are you going to tell them when they finally discover that? Who's Satan Claus or Santa Claus? What's all those things? And What have you planned and purposed? And it happens. It hasn't happened in the last few years. Some parents will say, Pastor Chick, could you please tell our children or our child that about Santa Claus? There's no Santa Claus. Really? I said, not a problem. I'll sit the kid down, six, seven years old, and said, I got some bad news for you. What is that? So I just, you know, God says to forgive, right? Forgive? And they're like, yeah. You need to forgive. Your parents have been lying to you your whole life. There is no Santa Claus. And they're really embarrassed to tell you. The parents are like, I thought you were going to tell them there's no Santa Claus. I am. And I'm telling them what incredible liars you are. And they need to forgive you. Will you forgive your parents? Jesus is real. Santa Claus is. And they just don't know how to bring it to you. That kind of cured people from me telling their kids that there's no Santa Claus. All right? If you kids are just finding out your parents are liars. But you know Jesus is real, right? All right. Is that because your dad's cheap and you never wanted to buy anything? Or Okay. Very good. All right. Understand this. Folks, plan and purpose. It's going to happen. Those who seek to live a godly life, what? you will be persecuted. They're going to hate you. Why? Because they hated Jesus first. These things are going to happen in your, your morals, your values, your convictions, your things. They're going to be challenged. It's going to happen. You are a Christian. Christ Jesus is in your life. What do you have to say? They're going to ask you. They're going to challenge you. You can live in this world, but the world does not need to live in you. In our hearts and our citizenship is in heaven, and that's where I'm going someday. Amen? Amen. Hey, women.